when's the last time you've explored off the map and have done something new? We want you to be able to have something brand new and fresh for your faith today. Welcome to North Coast Church. God's got something brand new in store for you today. My name is Trent Jenkins. I'm our online community pastor, and we're so glad to be able to have you with us today. Psalm 96, it says, sing a new song to the Lord. And I think that there's some new things for us, a part of North Coast Church and our online community. I think he's got some new things, a new word that he wants to be able to deliver to you in our message as well. Uh, Before I get to any of that, I just want to give a quick shout out to Matt. He's on a Navy ship. Matt, thank you so much for continuing to tune in to North Coast Church while you're out serving our country in some ocean across the world. We're so honored to be able to have you with us. To all of our men and women in the military, thank you for being a part of North Coast Church. Well, part of our online ministry, we're gonna continue to try to provide some new resources and some new ways for you to be able to kind of freshen your faith. And one of those ways I think is getting into God's word. We're gonna be providing some new ways for you to be able to memorize scripture, to be able to understand how to do that in a new way, how to be able to dive into God's word in a a new way as well. To be able to find out more information, simply go to our social media accounts at North Coast Online. That's our Instagram handle, North Coast Online. Or of course, you can always go to our website and to be able to see that information as well. Just go to our online campus. Let's go into our message. Get your notes ready. You can find them on our app or on our website. And as always, we want to be praying for you. Use this phone number. If you haven't saved this phone number, we encourage you, save this phone number. We use it for the daily dose. We use it for prayer requests. Simply text in your prayer request to this number. That way we can be praying over you. We're going to dive into worship and then hear from our pastor today.
Hey, North Coast, good to be with you again as we continue our study through the book of 1 John. And as I, I look at this book, I keep noticing something over and over, and that is John writes in a circular pattern uh, where he, a, a little bit of deja vu all over again, he keeps saying the same thing in a style of writing that emphasizes his major points. And today's passage circles back to a theme we have seen a few times, in particular a few weeks ago in chapter 2, where he was talking about the problem of counterfeit Christianity and how to recognize it and how to respond to it. Uh, I want to remind you that at that point when we were in chapter 2, uh, we saw that we are in the last days, but we've been in the last days for 2,000 years. It's the period between when Jesus went to heaven and when he comes back to set up his kingdom. And we often erroneously think when we read in the Bible, last days means last moments, right before he returns. We also saw that this term antichrist is actually only used four times in the Bible, and it's a description of one that is against the Messiah against Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. So it, it's, it's not a name, it's not a person, but it's a spirit that shows up within culture, within people. And we also have seen over and over that 1 John contains 11 different clarifying questions that when you ask them about yourself and others, make it quite clear that, oh yes, I really am in, or oh no, they are not in. And they are not designed so that we heap some extra shame and guilt on ourselves. Uh, John's purpose was to assure these people, not to scare these people, that indeed they were walking with God. And let me show you with great clarity that those who have walked away were never really really a, a part of us. 10 different times, 11 clarifying questions, some of them repeated multiple times, but 10, 10 different times he uses this phrase, here's how you can know one way or the other. So our passage today actually looks at two of these that we have seen before because uh, a few weeks ago when I was teaching this passage, I ended it by uh, uh, walking through all 11 of those clarifying questions. And today we circle back to uh, two of them. And John is helping us understand how to tell the difference between a spiritual con artist and the real deal. He starts out our passage today, by the way, get a Bible and uh, I, I look at it on your digital Bible or your phone, because we're not going to be putting all these verses up. We want you to be marking up and studying the passage yourself. But he starts out with this, and we'll go ahead and have it on the screen. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, 
but test the spirits. Those who claim to speak for God, those who claim to have spiritual insight, he says, don't be gullible. Don't, don't believe every spirit, but put them to a test to see whether they are from God. Why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 2,000 years ago, he wrote that, and it continues to be an incredibly important truth today. So let's go ahead and, and continue uh, with 1 John chapter 4. We're only looking at the first six verses, and we're going to circle back, and we're going to say, well, how does this apply on Monday? How do we figure out uh, how to put these ideas into real practice? So the passage reads like this, just like we just had. Dear friends, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because... Many false prophets have gone out in the world. Now, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Now, those are not terms we tend to use today, but to go back in history and understand what was going on, the false teaching of that moment that had drawn a large crowd and pulled many people away was based on some uh, 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 Greek uh, philosophy that there's a huge difference between the physical and spiritual, and the spiritual is important, the physical is really not that important at all. So therefore, Jesus wasn't a real man, really God in the flesh. He was a man that the Spirit of God came upon, and he lived left later. Well, it wasn't just an argument about who Jesus was, which isn't a very important argument, but it had all these implications in on how you live. Because if only the spiritual matters and the physical is just this little thing here, you can live like hell over here and, and say, yeah, but it, with my spirit, I'm in touch with God. You know, we have that today. I'm a very spiritual person as they're living a very unspiritual life. Uh, you go, what's up with that? Well, what's up with that is that same mindset that was around back then, because a group of self-appointed teachers had started teaching this stuff, and a large group had followed. And that's a reason, as we've seen, that John is writing this. And then he goes on and he says, this, this kind of teaching, these goofy ideas, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, you're from God. And you have overcome them, these false teachers who are opposed to Jesus' message and Jesus' mission. Why have you overcome them? Because, circle, highlight, and underline that phrase, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Now I want to stop right here and do a little sidebar of something very important that's not necessarily worth a whole message, but I, I, I don't want to just go into how to tell the difference between a truth teller and a spiritual fraud and ignore something very important here because it comes up over and over and over again. We have overcome the falsehood, the message of the enemy. Why? Because the one who is in you, the Holy Spirit in us, is greater than the one who is in the world. Who's that? That's Satan and his demonic forces and ideas. Now, why is this so important to stop and focus on? Simply this. There's a brand of scaredy cat Christianity that constantly keeps showing up. Some of you have never been there, but I guarantee a ton of you have, have, have been there, been told that, or you wonder about it. And scaredy cat Christianity makes no sense. And what scaredy cat Christianity does, it's worried about what I like to call spiritual cooties. Uh, I don't know if you remember that old phrase, but somebody had cooties, and if they touched you, now you had the cooties. And when I was growing up as a little kid, and my kids were growing up, uh, you know, that, uh, ah, you'd run from somebody. And, and there is this idea that spiritually, when I'm in the presence of evil, when evil has been in the presence of where I am, somehow by osmosis, the enemy and, and evil can, can, can touch my life. I've told many of you before the story of in my office, if you go in there, there is a spear up on the wall. And people ask me, what, what is that? Well, one of only two times in my life where without question, I was in the presence of demonic forces. I was uh, a couple hundred miles in, uh, into the Amazon and uh, a little tiny tribe, we took a little plane, landed on the dirt there. They had had no uh, contact with civilization until 11 years before. And uh, this tribe was uh, under the influence, their leader was a witch doctor, a real deal. 
I mean, that first night, it was the freakiest thing I'd ever heard. He snorts up his drugs and stuff, and he starts his crazy incantations and screaming and yelling and all of this kind of stuff. And like I said, it was one of only a couple times where I know, wow. Uh, usually, is this demonic or is it not? This was demonic. Well, he let the missionaries come into this little tiny tribe because they were bringing food and they were bringing plants and they, they were uh, providing good to the people. And of course, the missionaries were bringing Jesus Christ as well. The next day, I went up and I asked him for the spear that he used in his ceremony. And I can't even remember what I exchanged for it, but I actually got it uh, pre-9-11. I was able to put it on a plane and, and take it all the way home, and it's in my office. A witch doctor, demonic witch doctor's real spear used in his worship service. Well, you know what scaredy cat Christianity does? It's like, get some holy water, spray it all over the place. I know some of you are thinking, that's why you're so whacked up, Larry. No, I have it in there as a reminder that greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. That our, our, our enemy is not all it comes to be. We're going to talk about his power and, and, and how to avoid falling uh, into it. But one of the things is Satan is a great liar. And one of the things he lies about best is his power. He's, he's filled with bravado. And it's not really power. I, I want to remind you of some things. No one can touch you without the Lord allowing it. And when the Lord allows it, it might be a very difficult dark valley, but he will give you the strength to be able to endure that. Take a look at the first couple chapters in a book called Job in your Old Testament. And everything that happened to Job, the Lord allowed. Now, someday I want to stand before him and say, why'd you allow this and not allow that? I've got all kinds of questions. But the one certainty I have is this. I can't be touched without the Lord saying, okay, and giving me the strength and power to endure it. Not happily necessarily, not easily. I might be hanging on by the skin of my teeth, but I got what I need. You know, I have a lot of friends over the years uh, in vocational ministry who are teaching pastors. And uh, I, I've heard this, if I heard it once, I've heard it a hundred times, which is this idea, man, we were preaching on the enemy and therefore this week just went all to pieces as if somehow they are so important, he knows exactly what they're preaching on and he's after them. Here's what I want to remind you. Satan is not anti-God or the altar God, or, or that's not what it is. He's not the yin and the yang. Satan is a fallen angel. All his demons are fallen angels. They are created beings. They cannot be everywhere at once. They cannot read your mind. They, they, they cannot do all kinds of things. They have powers. But they're created beings. But uh, what we often do in scaredy cat Christianity is we think by osmosis evil comes in and we think the enemy is doing things that aren't just part of a fallen world. Or when we've got a temptation or thoughts from within, we blame it on him instead of realizing, no, that's a fallenness within our own heart. They are not all knowing. They are not all powerful. They can't be everywhere at once. They can't put thoughts in my brain. And they can't touch me without God's permission. By the way, practically speaking, that means quit worrying about all this little kind of cootie stuff or this has a bad starting point or a bad tradition or once was evil. No, we are reclaiming what was broken and what was lost and what was the enemies. We're reclaiming that for our Lord. It also has another practical implication. If greater is he in me than he is in the world, then when he is under attack, that's why the Bible says, don't run, stand up. You see, everything in me, when a trial or a hardship or something like that comes, I want to run away from it. When I'm tempted by the temptations of the flesh, which are not just sexual, they're towards greed, they're towards revenge, they're the things that come out of the wickedness of my own heart, well, what I often want to do then is pray about it for victory. The Bible says, greater is he who is in you than in the, the one in the world, so when he's attacked, stand up, take it, and he will flee for you, from you. Because his, his promises, and he comes to us in great beauty, but his powerful claims, ah, they're just bravado. He will run. But when it's dealing with the temptation inside, you don't pray about it. You don't try to be more committed to God to overcome it. You run from it. Why? Because the temptation is within. You're like a fish looking at your favorite lure. <laughs> you don't like swim around, look at it, try to give it a little lick. No, you swim away. That's how you survive. 
Greater is he in us than the one in the world. So with that sidebar said, too important to skip. Now I want to get back to the main thing we're looking at, which is how do we tell the difference when it's time to test the spirits between a truth teller and a lying fraud. So now back to verse five. They, those who were teaching a false gospel and, <clears throat> and the many who followed them are from the world. And therefore, this is the reason they speak the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We, John and the apostles, are from God. And whoever listens to us, John's word, the apostles' words, and their writings, like this letter and the things we have in our Bible, whoever listens to us is from God. Okay? This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. This is another of the 11 tests. What do you do with Jesus, Jeff? And then this other one, how do you respond to Scripture? You and I should not be surprised when the world around us disagrees with uh, Scripture (laughs) as a completely different worldview. Of course they do. And as we're going to see, the enemy has great power in the world systems and, and, and the viewpoint and worldview that we have. Don't be surprised, but also don't be angry at them. Remember, he is our enemy. They are the victims of the enemy. And whenever we have the idea that those who have bought into his lie are the enemy rather than the victims, we stop doing what God has called us to do, which is to win over the lost and not wipe them out. And to remember that we too were once in that darkness. I want to put up on the screen a verse that the Apostle Paul uh, wrote about our, our journey with God. As for you, that's you and me, you, all of us that are Jesus followers now, we were dead in our transgressions, our, our walking away in a different way, and our sins, the high-handed areas where we just said, God, I know what I'm supposed to do, I don't want to do it. In which you used to live when you, that's you and I, Follow the ways of this world and of the ruler and the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. In other words, every Jesus follower at some point, even those that had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home, there's a point in which we turn from darkness to light. And it's, it's, it's at that point we, we move. And we are so glad that God didn't say, well, you're in darkness, wipe you out. And we so quickly forget that we once believed the lie, some of us once lived the lie uh, full on with everything we had. And God comes and rescues us and he gives us the assignment, rescue others. You were dead in your uh, uh, transgressions and sins. Let's go ahead and look at the next one. All of us, every single one of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, do not miss this ever in your life as you follow Jesus. We were by our very nature, who we were at the core, not just what we did, just every part of us, were deserving of wrath, judgment. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace, we're always reminding you, that is unmerited favor. It's not that he looked at you and me and said, oh, that'll be a great draft pick someday. They'll grow into it. They'll get better. I see potential. No, we were by nature, by nature, deserving of wrath. And his unmerited favor is what saves us. And therefore, when I am around those who are caught up in the lies of the enemy, I need to realize my job is not to somehow get them so they're worthy. My job is to get them so they see. I don't write off anybody as, well, you're unworthy of God's grace because that's an oxymoron. God's grace is undeserved favor. I didn't deserve it, and absolutely they don't deserve it. I was given it, and I am called to offer it. That's our job. Now, with that said, let's circle back and talk about how this works day in and day out, this idea of testing the spirits. And on your note sheet, there's a section there that says how to quickly tell the difference between a spiritual truth teller and a lying fraud. And uh, I'm really emphasizing the word quickly right here because this is not something you got to spend hours on. If we will just know there's a real danger out there, if we'll just know what to look for, 
we'll be able to see it. Yeah, I, I find that spiritual falsehood is a lot like uh, those phishing scams that uh, uh, you can get. And so, you know, let, let me just pop an example of one, you know, some version of, uh, dear gullible, my client, an important banker here in Nigeria, has need of a middleman for a complicated, highly confidential real estate transaction. If you're willing to take on the role of a trusted middleman, in other words, don't tell anybody, we will pay you a transaction fee of 10000 upon close of escrow. Rescu- uh, escrow. I can't talk today. I talk for a living. Not a good one. Uh, we have carefully researched your financial integrity and character and have chosen you for this special opportunity. To learn more, go to www.bankofnigeria.com. Now, I know some of us have fallen for that. You know, something pops up on your computer, it's infected, uh, somebody sends you a, a text message and from Amazon or whatever, and you go there and click the link. But if you realize it's a real danger, you don't just respond intuitively. What do you do? You step back. And you, very quickly, you find out a couple of things like, this is weird. <laughs> is there any reason that person would know me? You, you hover over Bank of Nigeria and you get a whole different thing on that link that shows up for you. Uh, you I, I mean, there's just all of these things that scream out to you, something's wrong, and you quickly can assess that. Well, believe it or not, that's actually the way it works in the spiritual uh, area. Uh, in, in the world today, A prince in Nigeria might want to give you a bunch of money. Pastor Chris might ask you to go out and buy uh, gift cards so that somebody can get something. And of course, that text or email starts out, beloved brother, as if Pastor Chris or I ever have talked to anybody like that. Uh, You get a security alert. And then you just run through and you look and go, makes no sense. You see, some scams are easy to spot. Some are not so easy. But as long as we're aware and as long as we know what to look for, Even the not so obvious, you know, those with misspelling and everything like that, uh, that's exactly uh, what will happen. You'll be able to to find it. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you the three things to look for in our remaining time. Where do we go? What do we look for? So the first one is this. Never trust your gut. Never trust your gut. Why? Why? Because counterfeits are dangerous precisely because they look and seem so real, right? If I I go to the grocery store and I pull out Monopoly money and try to buy something with it, they're going to laugh at me and think I'm a jokester, right? There's there's no danger in that, and it's just not going to work. But if I have something that really looks like a $20 bill, feels like a $20 bill, and the only thing is all of them have the same serial number, or they don't have that little thread in them that you can look at a light and see... Well, that tells me something's wrong. And the reason you never want to trust your gut is it's too quick. Now, listen carefully here. Never trust your gut when it comes to truth. I was talking with my wife, Nancy, about this message, some things I was thinking of saying. And she said, but don't you always tell people to trust their gut? And I went, wow, you're really right. How does that contradiction work? Well, what I'm always telling leaders is this. And I do a lot of training and teaching of leaders Never, I mean, always trust your gut, I tell them. Uh, When you're meeting a person or you're walking into a situation. Because how many times, any of you are leaders, any of you hire people, anything like that, how many times have you known right away this is not a good fit, but you talked yourself into something you knew wouldn't work? How many times have you seen a situation and right away you know this does not smell right, but you started questioning yourself and and sooner or later you talk yourself into something you knew this was not the right time, the right place. See, in that area, man, that first impression is usually pretty important. But when it comes to truth, man, I never want to trust my gut because I can jump too quickly to uh, the idea, well, this just feels good. You see, when I trust my gut, and our culture does a lot of that, uh, what happens is I begin to think sincerity is the cheat code that turns a lie into truth. You know those cheat codes on a video game where, well, once you know that, you can do this or do that that you normally couldn't do or turn the tables completely. Well, we live in a culture and a world, and because we live in it, we all tend to think that same thing, whether we're following Jesus or not, that we tend to overvalue sincerity as a cheat code. And by that, I mean, we'll have this idea, well, I know what God says to do, but it doesn't make sense to me. So 
my sincere belief that this doesn't make sense excuses me from making a decision opposite of what God tells me to do. Or the classic, well, I feel peace about this. Well, good for you. You know, there's a lot of people who feel peace about things, and it ends up taking them completely to the wrong place. It doesn't make sense to me. It's not a good reason to reject God's way. I feel peace about it. It's not a good reason to disobey God's command because somehow I'm different. Or <laughs> one of Chris's my favorites is, well, I found an expert on the Internet, and they completely agree with me. Finding a so-called expert out there, I don't care what degrees they have, I don't care what kind of brain on a stick they are, is not a good reason to rewrite the Bible <laughs> because I found somebody who agrees with me. So how does, how does this really work out? Well, if we're not going to trust our gut, we're going to remember a couple of things. We're going to do what I like to call measure twice, cut once. Every carpenter knows that, right? If you miss it the first time and it's too short, you can keep cutting it a million times. It's always going to be too short. You measure twice on anything important, and then you cut once. That's what we need to do with truth. We're, we're seeking truth in any area, but particularly in the spiritual realm. Proverbs puts it this way. There's a way that appears to be right. I've got peace about it. It makes sense. Well, everybody else is doing it, but in the end, it leads to death. And my bet is any of you that are 35, 40 years or older, you can look back at a decision or two. You were absolutely certain was right. You had total peace about it. And you look back and go, man, that was a mistake. It, peace is not the thing. Now, the second reason you don't want to trust your gut when it comes to is this a truth teller or a spiritual fraud it's because the spiritual fraud is informed by Satan, and Satan is the greatest liar in the entire universe. He's amazing. Again, his, his claims to power are bravado, but when he comes, he doesn't come in a stupid little red sur, uh, suit smelling like sulfur with a little tail thing on saying, hey, I'm here to wipe you out. No, he comes in great beauty. He comes with great logic. He's incredible, the best liar ever. And the best liars, even in our world, that you and I have run across, why do they get away with it? Because their lies seem so true. That's the thing that's going on here. And, and the fact is, when it comes to his influence on this world, all of his maps promise fulfillment. Every time, well, God's way won't work. Here's a better way. They all promise fulfillment. To fill that empty hole in my life, to, to give me this thing that I so deeply desire, to uh, acquire what I think everybody uh, wants and needs. They all promise fulfillment, and every single one of them, though, leads to despair and destruction. Let me tell you how good he is at lying. Do you know, according to the Bible, one-third of the angels fell? Now, think about that. The demonic forces, his angels, are fallen angels, and his claim was, I am equal to God. And a third of the angels, in the presence of God believed it. I mean, that is mind-boggling to me that that could happen. Or think of the very beginning of our Bible in, in Genesis chapter 3. You've got Adam and Eve, and they're told there's only one thing they can't eat of. And before they're done interacting with him, they both have eaten of the one forbidden fruit. And he's promised them, and they totally believe it because he's taken a bite and didn't die physically. The Lord had warned him you're going to die. They probably thought physically but it was actually spiritually. He says, look, I'm perfectly fine. Everything is good. And they eat of it in that very moment. They die spiritually. They, oh, they live physically. We're their, their uh, descendants. But the, the sin and the death and the sorrow in this whole world started then and has continued. They had no sin nature. They're in a perfect environment. They're in relationship with the Father. Crazy. And today, the whole world, we're told in the Bible, lies under his spell. <laughs> I, you don't have to look far to realize there's a bunch of intellectual morons propagating his poisonous and goofy ideas, and people are saluting them. So why do I think he can't fool me? I'm not going to just go, wow, that looks really good. I don't care who it is, how it is, how logical. I'm going to step back and measure twice before I cut once. And that means I'm going to go to Scripture. Now, here's the second thing we need to keep in mind, and it's this. 
Never assume power and giftedness. Spiritual power actually carried out and great giftedness are proof of God's approval and truth. I think all of us, including myself, if I see somebody with great spiritual power, I see somebody that's very eloquent, uh, I see somebody that's got incredible giftedness, I go, oh, God must be behind that. But Scripture says, no, test those spirits. And Scripture gives example after example that reminds me it is the fruit, not the giftedness, it's not the power that I trust in, and it's the alignment with what God has already told me. God is never going to change his mind and come with a second message. So let me give you some examples. You've heard of Moses. Moses is a guy who after 300 years led the children of Israel uh, out of uh, slavery in Egypt. He shows up as a, as a shepherd that's been a fugitive shepherd on the run for 40 years. He shows up before Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And it's like, who in the world are you? So, uh, so uh, Aaron, his brother, they, 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 they throw a, a stick on the ground and it turns miraculously into a, a snake. But guess what? Pharaoh's magicians duplicated that same thing. In fact, when you read through Exodus chapter 7 through chapter 8, you're going to find the first uh, three miracles that Moses did, the magicians were able to duplicate them with their demonic powers. After the fourth one, they came and said to Pharaoh, like, we can't do this. This must be a God. We got a problem here. But for three of them, demonically powered, they duplicated it. Listen to what Moses says in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 13, verses 1 to 4. I believe it's on your note sheet. He says, if a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a sign or a wonder, and if the sign or wonder spoken takes place, so they pulled it off. And the prophet says, let us follow other gods, gods you've not known, let us worship them. You must not listen to the words of that prophet. And it goes on. He says, don't be duped by power. Don't be duped by giftedness. To carry this a little bit further, you know, the Bible talks about a lawless leader in the end times that's going to raise, uh, rise up to great power. Well, in a book called Second Thessalonians in the New Testament, we hear about him. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan. Oh, totally lined up satanically. So how's it going to be displayed? In all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders. Uh, did you know, according to Revelation chapter 13, at one point, I, we don't know metaphorically, like literally or how that works, but he will call down fire from heaven. Do you know 2 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us that, that, that Satan comes and his messengers as, as angels of light, not darkness, and of righteousness, calling us to a righteous moral standard, any, whatever it'll take from destruction to morality that will keep us away from the Lord. God never changes his mind. What he wrote to us is true. And if he doesn't come along and say, let me clarify this with a little more information, like you might see in a legal document where it makes a statement and it clarified a little bit later, I am never going to let somebody else come in and say, well, what he really meant was or what this was. Because I don't care how gifted or powerful they are. The fact of the matter is, if they bring a different good news gospel, if they bring a different Jesus, if they bring a different message, they're not from God. They're lying spiritual frauds. So don't trust your gut. Be very, very careful with that and never make the mistake of assuming power is somehow um, the approval and sign of God's approval and truth. And here's, here's the third one. As you're looking at that, like that phishing email, you look for this and this, a few things. Here's three telltale signs of Satan's lies. Little things, they're going to jump out, you, out at you if you'll take the time to be aware of the problem and to look carefully. Number one is this. They'll always bring a different Jesus. They will always bring a different Jesus. So watch out for these telltale signs. Now, I want to let Jesus tell me who he is. <laughs> we live in a day and age where we decide to tell Jesus who he is. Uh, do any of you remember those little bracelets, uh, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I, I mean, it's not a bad thing to kind of think, oh, how would Jesus respond here? But here's a weird thing. Lots of people were wearing those things who had no idea what Jesus did. 
their question of, well, what would Jesus do was just like, well, this is what I think he would do. I mean, I, I, I recently was reading an article about an interview with uh, somebody and they, they were saying, well, that's just not very Christian. And the thing they said was not very Christian was exactly explicitly what the Bible actually says. But they had their own idea of Jesus. And, and th that's what the spiritual frauds have always done. They bring a Jesus, but it's a different Jesus. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And, and he clearly, over and over, we saw it when we were walking through the uh, gospel or good news of Jesus, John's Jesus story. He clearly said, I am God in the flesh. I want to show you just a couple of verses to remind you of those. Uh, so at one point, when he was breaking the Sabbath, you know, uh, Old Testament day, and they had made all these man-made rules around it, which Jesus didn't break God's law. He broke their man-made laws. And, and so he told them why, and, and, and he talked about his father, and it says, this, are, this is religious leaders. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him, not only because he was breaking their rules about the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father. And those that were around then totally understood what that meant. He made himself equal with God. That's who he claimed to be. Everybody that was around him at that point had no mistake. This dude says he is God in the flesh. I give you another passage from John chapter 8 that's very similar to that. Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Well, this is a very critical phrase because there was a burning bush that came to Moses when he was out in the wilderness saying, go, uh, go and let my people go. And this bush is burning, but not being consumed. And he goes up to look at it and, and it talks to him. Imagine that. I, that must have blown him away. And, and, and then he, it says, go and let my people, well, well, who are you? And God answers with this phrase. The Greek version of it is ego I me, I am. In other words, I am past, I am present, I am future. I am always existing. That is my name. I am. Guess what? Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, ego I me. That ex same exact phrase. <laughs> At this, they picked up stones to stone him as a blasphemer to kill him right then and there. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple crowns. The apostles were incredibly clear. Jesus was and is a real person who really died, who really physically rose from the dead, and who was and is God in the flesh. Any other kind of Jesus is false. And it'll take you, it'll give you promises, but it'll take you to the wrong place. You know, C.S. Lewis is the one most famous for pointing out he was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. The fact is, a good man, a good teacher, doesn't claim to be God, okay? Okay. They will also bring along with a different Jesus, inevitably a different path to heaven. They'll say, well, Jesus is a way, not the way. And they'll say, well, sincerity really works here. Or, well, you know, it's all the same God and they're different, all kinds of things that make, again, they're beautiful lies, but they're lies. Let's see what Jesus said. Either liar or lunatic or maybe Lord. I am the, not a way, I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. I don't know how clear we can get with that. We've pointed it out over and over and over again. Now, you might not agree with that. I might wonder why is it so narrow? All those kind of questions are absolutely legitimate. But listen, I'm not going to come along and go, well, you know what? Those are four or five good reasons why Jesus was wrong. Because if Jesus was wrong about that, he is not worth one moment of my time. If Jesus wasn't a real person who raised from the dead and is alive now at the right hand of the Father, part of the triune Godhead, I of all people ought to be most pitied sitting my whole life in vocational ministry. And by the way, that's what the Apostle Paul actually said too. He said, all of us, if this is not totally true, we're worthy of not respect, we're worthy of pity. Now, the last thing, along with a different Jesus, um, a, a different path to heaven, they always bring a different morality. This is what you watch for. Kind of Jesus one off. Oh, not really Jesus as the only way. But also, they always bring a different morality because that's the end game. 
uh, the, the actual uh, historic problem that John was writing to. Oh, Jesus wasn't really God, flesh and spirit. I talked to you earlier and the end game was, so therefore don't really worry about these areas of your morality because it's just a physical thing that's going to die. Your spirit will live forever. Now, sometimes that different morality is stricter. Uh, you'll, you'll have people like, like the Pharisees of old who, who took God's law and fences and built extra fences around it, uh, beyond it just in case. Uh, and then they use them also to keep the riffraff out. It was a way of, you know, it's kind of in almost every field. Once it becomes a profession, they have like an entrance exam so that more people can't get in, you know. Uh, you were once in this profession uh, before and you didn't have to be part of something. But we always keep raising the bar to keep others out. And we can do that spiritually. But more often, the most common one throughout history and today is this, a looser moral code. That simply says, I know God said that, but this is a different a day and age. I know God said that, but your situation and circumstances are different. You see, Satan's most common lie is that God didn't really mean what he said. If you go back and read this week, Genesis chapter 3, the first 13 verses, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, tempted by the enemy. He basically says, God didn't really mean what he said. He said, God's holding out of you, uh, out on you, in fact, that you're missing out on something really great, the knowledge of good and evil by not eating this. And see, I just ate some of it, nothing wrong with me. And God was keeping them from the knowledge of good and evil, not intellectually, but experientially. They paid a high price. Today's so-called enlightened new morality is nothing more than old-fashioned immorality dressed up in new clothes. The Bible's not a lifestyle blog. <laughs> it's not some little TikTok thing where, oh, I didn't know this. You know, thanks for this new life hack or whatever it'd be. It's not a book of good advice. It's either a totally fraudulent thing or it's what it claims to be, the word of God. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote this uh, in terms of our response when we pick and choose. He, he's writing here about morality, the sexual morals of that day and this day and what God calls us to. And he says, listen, he's been telling what to do. Anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. I mean, I've, <laughs> we all see it, how it shows up in our life groups and our friends, and I don't mean to be harsh and judgmental in it, but there's always this comment, well, I just don't agree with that. Okay, that makes sense. Let's Take a look and, well, that's what the verse says. Well, I just don't agree with that. What I want us to understand is we're not rejecting something in a book. We're rejecting God. And, and it's so common because we live in a culture of itching ears. And what do I mean by itching ears? Well, we live in a day and age where most of us, from our news sources to whatever it would be, uh, sometimes even the church and we choose the pastors we choose, we're really looking for affirmation of what we already believe rather than information so we can grow in knowledge and truth. And the Apostle Paul told Timothy, a young pastor, this is going to happen. 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine or sound teaching. Instead, to suit their own desires, they're going to gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want them to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. That's why I don't want to trust my gut. That's why I want to be so careful and look at this thing. Because I know you have itching ears, but I'll have to admit I do too. I love it when I come across something that agrees. I, you know, when I'm around people, I, sometimes we'll be talking about things and I'll, I'll come home and I go, they're so brilliant. They agree with everything I think. And that's how we can treat Scripture. You see, God's grace and mercy, when we're down this path of itching ears, this new morality, here's one of the things they're always going to say. Hey, God's a God of love. God understands. He'll be good with it. As long as you're sincere, as long as you're not trying to hurt anybody, as long as you're doing what seems best to you. And they turn, actually, God's grace as unmerited favor into a license or permission to walk in evil. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, the book right before, a little, little like text message short one-chapter book, right before Revelation, 
he's speaking to a problem where certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert, they twist, they change, they mangle it beyond all recognition. What? The grace of our God. How do they do that? They turn it into a license for immorality and they deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Folks, there has been so much in the last uh, decade or so rewriting of the clear moral codes that Jesus has given us. But it's not a new thing. It has shown up throughout past history. There have been times and places, well, it's okay to kill the enemies of God. It's okay to do this. It's okay. We come along and we rewrite his moral code. It's not just in the sexual realm. It's in all of his morality. And then we say, but it's okay. He will understand. Test the spirits. Test that which claims to bring God's word, God's truth, God's way to you. Test it against the words of Jesus. Test it against the apostles' teaching found in the New Testament. And make sure that as you're doing the test, that Jesus is your and my God, not our cosmic consultant. And make sure, as we're measuring twice, we're using the right ruler. That we let the Bible judge us and tell us the truth rather than judging the Bible and deciding what is true. If you do that, you will not be led astray. Back to the phishing emails and things that pop up, pop-ups on your computer, whatever it would be. If you're aware of the problem and you look for these obvious telltale signs, you're not going to have a problem. You don't need to live in fear you don't need to worry about demonic cooties. You just need to follow simply day in and day out what he clearly has told us to do. And when you do, you will be the people John wrote to, where I assure you, this is how you tell they are they, and this is how you know you are God's. Father, would you take this passage and these things that we've looked at and would you help us to see and to understand how and where they apply to our lives? And not with binoculars, as I always say, Lord, to other people, but in our own life, as we sometimes let the culture, the world, and our own thoughts somehow judge you and your word instead of you and your word judging and telling us what the truth is. I ask this to the glory of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And remember, we want to try to provide you additional resources. Go to our Instagram handle, North Coast Online. You can find us there or Facebook or just go to our website. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to having you back next week.